Welcome everyone and thanks so much for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Mary Ann Hensley. I'm the Vice President of Media Operations for FreightWaves and we are happy to present today's webinar in partnership with Vector. We have a really special discussion planned for you today as we'll be hearing from a couple of experts who will be sharing the ins and outs of e-documents and digitization in the transportation and logistics industry. We'll be hearing from Rick Schweitzer, Legal Counsel for the National Private Truck Council and Will Chu, CEO and co-founder of Vector. After the conversation, you're also welcome to stick around for a product demo to see Vector's recently announced electronic bill of lading solution. And you'll have the opportunity to submit your questions to our experts for the live audience Q&A following the discussion as well. Before we dive in, I'd like to cover just a couple of quick items. First, if you have any issues during the webinar, please feel free to reach out to our team via the group chat function in your webinar console. And if you have questions that you would like to ask Rick and Will, please enter those through the Q&A box in your console, and we'll answer as many of those as possible at the end of today's discussion. And at this point, I will go ahead and turn things over to Will Chu, CEO and co-founder of Vector, to kick things off. Glad to have you here today, Will. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to you, Marianne and Freightways for, for having us. And thank you, uh, Rick, for joining us to, to discuss. Mm -hmm. um, Rick uh, you know, has been the government affairs liaison and the general counsel for the National Private Trunk Council for uh, over 20 years, right, Rick? Um, yes. <laughs> and uh, he's a uh, very much an experienced expert in the practice of fleet transportation as it relates to both shippers and, and shippers with private fleets. Um, he works very closely with the FMCSA, you know, has been an incredibly valuable resource uh, for companies large and small. Um, you know, uh, for every conference that I'm at, that Rick's at, his, his uh, sessions are very well attended. Um, and, you know, he's has a track record for helping companies navigate, um, you know, times of change and crisis. Um, you know, a lot of, um, he was a valuable resource uh, during the ELD mandate. And, um, you know, in times of crisis such as now, uh, there are lots of questions and lots of um, issues regarding uh, workflow changes and potentially as it relates to, to e-documents. <clears throat> you know, the, uh, before I begin, um, Rick, um, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and, and, and your practice? Sure, I, I'm a transportation lawyer. Um, in private practice, I have my own practice and it's based in, in the District of Columbia. As Will mentioned, I do serve as general counsel for the National Private Truck Council, which is an organization of several hundred companies that operate their own private truck fleets. Many of your companies might be members of it, um, but I also represent a number of other uh, trade associations and they, they're all in trucking, the bus industry or in hazardous materials shipments. Um, I serve as counsel to the American Moving and Storage Association, the American Bus Association, and several other trade associations uh, representing shippers and carriers of hazardous materials and packaging manufacturers. Um, so I work closely with, as Will said, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, but also the Pipelines and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration at DOT and a number of other federal regulatory agencies. Um, it's primarily a regulatory practice. Uh, I do and have written uh, a fair amount of legislation, some of which has been enacted into law. And I also work with carriers and shippers uh, on regulatory and commercial issues on a, on a regular basis as well. So with that, why don't we get started, Will? Sounds great. Um... You know, th this current pandemic has created an urgency and need for shippers and carriers uh, to really facilitate the contactless pickup and, and delivery workflow. Uh, you know, prior to the pandemic, it was common for drivers to interact with employees at, at shipping facilities. You know, it was very much the de facto workflow for, for drivers to go check in at a guard shack, um, you know, go to the welcome center, get their paperwork, get their trailer seal, get loaded and then um, before they leave, again, check out other guard shack. And at each of those interaction points, you know, it's an opportunity for the possible yeah. transmission of the coronavirus. And so a lot of companies are, are now looking to eliminate that. And the reason for a lot of those interactions was uh, because of, of paperwork. 
you know, getting the BOL, getting it signed, making sure that everything checks off on, on the BOL. And so when companies are now looking to digitize a lot of their processes, it's, it's really because they want to facilitate the contactless uh, process. And so given that, there's a lot of questions around e-documents, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because here's an opportunity for technology to step in either you know, on a telemax platform, on a mobile device or a tablet, for the possible sharing of um, documents digitally. So never touching paper, uh, having that information right uh, on the tablet, having the driver sign for it, having you know more contextual inf information, whether it be photographs or photographs of the trailer seal. So the last piece of that is making sure that you know fleets and shippers are compliant uh, with the DOT and specifically the FMCSA and, and law mm -hmm. enforcement. Um, so I'll start there and just you know start off with the big question is you know what is the FMCSA stance? or the law enforcement stance on, on digital or e-documents, specifically EBOLs? Okay. Uh, with regard to bills of lading, and, and we'll start there, um, there is a requirement in statute and in regulation that a, a carrier, and I mean a for-hire carrier, has to issue a bill of lading or a receipt to a, a shipper. Um, if you're a private carrier, you're both the shipper and the carrier, so you don't need a... Uh, bill of lading for a shipment for private carriage. But for, for higher carriage, you do. Um, and they do allow, uh, the FMCSA does allow electronic uh, uh, transmission of bills of lading for shipments that are not hazardous materials. Um, they also specifically allow uh, electronic signatures on uh, bills of lading. Um, for hazardous materials, it's a little bit different. There actually is a requirement for the pipelines and hazardous materials uh, safety administration that the shipping paper, which is different from a bill of lading, although it can actually be the same document, uh, but it has to actually accompany a shipment. For non-hazmat, it's typical, and it has been historically, in, uh, the process that a, a bill of lading is a paper document that accompanies the shipment. For, but it, it doesn't have to. For hazmat, it must under the regulations. Why? Well, because a uh, hazmat shipping paper is a different kind of animal. A bill of lading serves three purposes. It's a receipt for the goods, it's a contract of carriage, and it's also a, a document of title or evidence of title. Um, it's a commercial document, in essence. A hazardous material shipping paper, on the other hand, is a hazard communication document. And it provides information to an emergency responder in the event of an accident or an incident where there is potentially a spill of the hazardous material. So FEMSA has taken the approach that you need to have a physical copy of the document accompany the shipment um, so that an emergency responder at the site can access uh, information about the nature of the shipment. Uh, that's the theory. Uh, it doesn't always work in practice. If you have a, a massive fire, you're not going to be able to access a copy of a paper, um, uh, shipping paper document. But um, in uh, any event, that is the regulatory requirement. For non hazmat, however, um, it's not absolutely required that you have the bill of lading accompany the freight. It's often the practice of the carriers. It's sometimes asked for at the roadside by a roadside inspection official, but you're not absolutely required to have one. And uh, uh, if you can provide one uh, on an electronic basis, that generally is uh, sufficient for a roadside official, even though they're not uh, uh, absolutely authorized to ask for it in the first place. Got it. That That's helpful. Are there any new policies or any kind of exemptions that the FMCSA is considering for, um, for e-documents or digital BOLs? For digital BOLs, no. But I think that we can learn from the experience of um, electronic logging devices that were put
put into effect uh, in December of 2018. Um, and in that regard, uh, the FMCSA did set out performance requirements for electronic logging devices that had to be met. Uh, one problem that we ran into, which is a typical problem, uh, is that the telematics of one vendor's uh, ELD didn't necessarily match up with or communicate with or recognize uh, the telematics of another vendor. So, for instance, if you had a carrier that was operating a fleet of trucks using one vendor's ELDs, and you have a truck go out of service and have to be replaced um, on a, a short-term basis because of repair or an accident, um, the rental truck might or might not have the same telematics on the ELD as the company's uh, electronic logging device system. Uh, the FMCSA considered this in the rulemaking but simply assumed that the industry would take care of that and come up with some sort of uniform standard. That didn't happen, and understandably so, because uh, these are proprietary systems. So uh, the Truck Renting and Leasing Association, for instance, asked for a waiver that would have allowed companies to operate on a 30-day rental basis with just paper logs because there was a problem with the telematics. And that was granted, but only for eight days at a time. So now if you rent a vehicle, um, you can use paper logs rather than an ELD, but only for eight straight days while you're getting the truck repaired or, or maintained. Um, you know, I, I, I sense that there will be similar problems um, in universal adoption with electronic bills of lading as well. Um, and if I could, I'll, I'll read you just one email that I have from one motor carrier recently who is working on this process just on a commercial basis. Um, he says, the problem as I see it is standardization of the process. Of the approximately 125,000 loads we delivered last year, four shippers made up 60% of them. So only four different bills of lading, and we have a hard time getting them to agree on one API process to transmit the document to us. Imagine the headache if we had hundreds of shippers. So I, I see the real problem is not a regulatory issue so much as a, an industry standardization issue. The FMCSA, I think, is amenable to electronic transmission and electronic signatures, and they have policies that specifically allow that in electronic retention of bills of lading, um, but I, I think the question is going to be whether or not um, carriers and shippers are going to have systems that talk to each other. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, you know, from our perspective at Vector, um, we see that the shipper is the owner of the uh, BOL before it gets handed off to the carrier. And we are acting as a conduit from the shipper to the carrier. And so we want to take that that burden off of carriers in, in terms of integrating. And uh, even with other technology partners, we uh, have really developed our technology to integrate work with the existing systems to not only ingest the BUL, to, but to route it to the right carrier and specifically the, the right driver. Um, regardless, you know, I think the best policy is always to remain uh, open and to work with the community on making sure that uh, whatever technology is developed is uh, adhering to standards and, and, and it, that information is shared. It's it's kind of like uh, developing an electric car charging network that can only work with one <coughs> specific car, Tesla. Sure. Um, it doesn't make that much sense. And so, um, you know, for us, we, we definitely um, are working with not only trade organizations such as the Consumer Brands Association, the CSCMP, uh, the MPTC, but we're, we're trying to make sure that whatever uh, standard is adopted, it can be adopted by not just us and, and other technology vendors. Mm -hmm. Great. And, and going along that line, I mean, do you have an idea of maybe why, you know, there hasn't been widespread uh, adoption of eDocs? And it makes a lot of sense, but 
you know, up until this point, you know, uh, there wasn't a lot of adoption. Do you have a sense of potentially why? Well, I, I mean, to, to your first point, um, it does make a lot of sense. Um, and I, from my standpoint, um, e-documents reduce mistakes. Um, there's no need for individual uh, typing up of bills of lading or other documents. Uh, there's there's no mm -hmm. transcription error uh, possibility. You can't lose the document. It's much easier to, to transmit it. Um, you have absolute um, uh, electronic indication of when it was transmitted. It's easier to store the documents. Um, and in this time of, of the COVID pandemic, it prevents you or allows you uh, to not have hand-to-hand -hand transmission of the documents, although now there's questions about whether or not this coronavirus can be uh, transmitted via surface contact, but uh, let's assume it can for purposes of this discussion. Um, so, you know, there are lots of, uh, of benefits to using electronic documents. So why haven't they been adopted universally? It's inertia, probably, um, and, and also because of the fact that there are just lots of small carriers and small shippers out there. Um, they don't have the wherewithal themselves to uh, develop this technology. The government has not developed the technology for them. They have left this to the private sector, and that's probably the right way to handle it. Um, and. You know, I, I think there's also, as I mentioned before, this question of uh, uh, uniformity. Um, there's no one technology that everyone agrees is the standard for using this. Um, so it's um, there's there are multiple places to go, I suppose. And, and if you're dealing with multiple carriers or multiple shippers, it can seem like a daunting task for somebody who's already got too much to do on a daily basis. Got it. That that makes sense. So it doesn't seem it's like a it's not a regular or sorry it's not a regulatory issue or policy issue, but more just uh, inertia, um, kind of market dynamics with smaller carriers, and uh, maybe the, even the technology hasn't caught up yet. But um, yeah. Now there's there's one exception to the statement that it's not a regulatory issue, and that's for hazmat shipments. Because it, as yep. I mentioned at, at the outset, there is a requirement, and, and we're talking about motor carriers right now, there is a requirement that you have to have a paper, shipping paper, which is, again, the hazard communications document, um, accompany the, the uh, shipment. So it does not specifically allow for electronic transmission of shipping papers for shipments by truck. For shipments by rail, it's different. The uh, FEMSA does have regulations that specifically recognize electronic transmission of shipments, hazmat shipments for rail. Um, I am working with a group of motor carriers right now to petition FEMSA to um, recognize and allow electronic transmission of shipping papers for motor carriers as well. The American Trucking Associations, I believe it was last week, had their chairman testify before the Senate Commerce Committee, and he specifically asked DOT to adopt uh, uh, protocols to allow electronic transmission of shipping papers for hazmat shipments by truck as well. Um, whether or not you can accomplish that by legislation or, or regulation, um, even if Congress passes a law that says DOT has to do this, they'll probably still have to go through the regulatory process. So, um, but there, there are multiple efforts underway to try to push FEMSA to have a regulation that would essentially put trucks and, and rail on the same playing field and, and allow both of them to have um, e-documents for transmission of shipping papers. Understood. Do you have a sense of timeline of how long something like that would would take in effect? Is that on a ten year? Sure. If we if we file a petition for rulemaking in the next couple of weeks, which probably is a reasonable timeline, um, best case scenario would be a year before they they FIMSA would have to recognize and accept the petition. They have to publish it in the Federal Register as a notice and ask for public comment. There's at least a 30-day comment period once it's published in the Federal Register. 
once they get the comments, they have to consider them and then decide whether or not to write a final rule. Um, if they uh, write a final rule, then they have to publish that in the Federal Register as well. So, I, you know, best case, it'll be a year, but more likely two to three, even if it, everything goes very, very smoothly. Now, it's, it's possible that that could be streamlined. And um, President Trump just this past month issued another executive order that directs all federal agencies to do everything they can to streamline regulations, to withdraw regulations on a temporary or permanent basis in order to facilitate commerce for purposes of, of um, uh, economic recovery coming out of the COVID pandemic. And I think this fits into that um, executive order's philosophy. But again, it's, it's up to the regulatory agency to run with the ball. Got it, that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you. Mary Ann, I, I, I think you know, we're 20 minutes in. I'd love to turn it over to the audience and um, open the floor and, and ask, uh, allow them to ask Rick uh, a few questions. Yes, absolutely. Um, the first question that we've had come through, other than for government shipments and international shipments, do BOLs need to be signed? What about delivery receipts? What other options exist for signatures at shipment and receipt? Um, the, the answer to the first question is yes, for b bills of lading and for delivery receipts. And, and that's not necessarily a regulatory requirement, but it's it's a commercial requirement in order to show evidence, in essence, of receipt of delivery and acceptance of delivery. So if you have a uh, bill of lading and or a delivery receipt that you present to the, the consignee, uh, you want to get a signature so that the consignee essentially um, acknowledges acceptment of the delivery and um, if, if the consignee is required to um, pay on delivery, if it's a COD shipment, uh, it's also evidence of, uh, or can be evidence of payment as well. Now, how do you do that if you don't wanna actually get a physical uh, signature? Well, I think all of us have now, since we've been home for the past two or three months, have been using Amazon and UPS and lots of other um, uh, home delivery services. And we've started getting um, texts with photographs of the package on our front porch. Um, a photograph is one way to evidence delivery. It doesn't necessarily indicate acceptance of delivery, but it evidences that delivery was in fact made. And it shows that the package was put um, in the, the receivers, uh, at the receiver's residence. Um, another possibility is the use of trailer seals. If you have a broken trailer seal, that's obviously evidence that someone, not necessarily the consignee, but someone actually accessed uh, the goods um, that were delivered. Um, those are probably not as good of evidence of not just delivery, but acceptance of delivery as a signature, however. I think a signature, whether it's an e-signature or not, um, is the best evidence that the uh, constantly has in fact received the delivery and accepts it. All right, great. And before we move on to the next question, I'm going to go ahead and deploy a poll. You will see a question uh, for those of you listening in, pop up on your screen, take your time, answer that, and we'll go over the results for that here in just a second. Uh, for the next question, Rick, what's your pulse at the state level with roadside inspection and authorities' willingness to accept electronically transmitted BOLs? Uh, you know, I, again, I would go to the um, experience with electronic logging devices. There, the FMCSA's rules say that you either have to have a display or a printout capability so that you can show your driver log for the past seven days to an enforcement official at roadside. Um, and that seems to be universally accepted. It's acceptable to FMCSA, it's acceptable to the states. 
uh, who are their partners and enforcement. I would envision um, that a roadside inspector would similarly accept a bill of lading um, that was either on an electronic display on the vehicle or if the vehicle had printout capabilities that would show that. I mean, as long as you can immediately present the document um, to the uh, roadside official, uh, I don't see there being a problem. All right, great. And we will go ahead and deploy the results here. So what is your primary document challenge? Um, it looks like a, a couple tie pretty closely here. So transitioning from paper to digital documents uh, being almost 37%, collecting documents from drivers quickly and efficiently, a little over 34%, um, and then navigating rules and regulations around e-docs for 17%. Um, no document challenges for seven and a half percent of you, and then storing, labeling, and organizing documents for future use. Uh, Will, Rick, what are your thoughts there? Do you feel like that kind of lines up with what you guys have seen as well? Yes, and I'd like to congratulate the seven and a half percent who have no, no problems there. <laughs> You're doing great. You get a gold star. Um, yeah, I, I think what that tells me is, is that this is is really a commercial issue rather than a, a regulatory issue, although. The regulatory questions provide a fair amount of uncertainty as a background uh, to this, but it, it's really a problem of getting your company and your personnel to adopt a platform and implement it and work with it so that it makes your life easier rather than harder. Um, Will, what do you think? I, I, I think so too. Um, I think the Technology now has caught up to a point, especially with the, you know, the ELD mandate and the the the, the ubiquity of telematics and also the ubiquity of, of mobile devices. You know, drivers have access to the technology to facilitate digital transmission and e-signature of, of documents. So I think um, you know it's the confluence of interesting times with the technology being there and then also the the kind of safety and health need of of digital documents. So I think it is the right time for it. All right, great. Um, and then next question from the audience. Um, the FMCSA is only for truckers, correct? Yes, their jurisdiction is over motor carriers, either a for hire carrier or a private carrier. They do not regulate shippers at this point. All right, great. Um, and then next one. Do you see regulation changes to the hazmat requirement to have paperwork in hand in the future? Uh, we're working on that, as I said. Um, I'm working with a group uh, that is going to petition FIMSA for uh, recognition of electronic transmission of shipping papers by motor carrier. Uh, the regulations already allow that for rail, but not for motor carriers. And as I said, you know, it's going to take probably several years to get this done, best case scenario, but uh, we're in the process now. All right, great. And next question. Do you have any guidance or experience concerning EDOCs for ocean and air transportation? Um, less than for truck, to be very honest with you. But my, um, my assumption is that EDOCs have been used uh, probably more so in the ocean and air transportation uh, industries than in the trucking industry, um, simply because I, I think there are fewer shipments and perhaps fewer carriers on a regular basis. So it's easier to standardize. Okay. And next, are there any issues with regular DOT officer driver stops and a driver not having a hard copy of what is on board um, specific to non-HAZMAT? You know, there, there, I looked at this question, and there's nothing that specifically says that a driver must have a copy of a bill of lading or some sort of inventory or shipping document showing what that driver has on board the vehicle um, for non-hazmat. So, um, you know, I, I think the answer is you're not required to have it. And having said that, 
Um, I have been doing this, Will, I'm afraid to admit, more than 30 years, not more than 20 years, but <laughs> I've never had this question come up as a problem. So I think there's your answer. All right, and next question, what constitutes an e-signature? Can it be something as simple as a checkbox on a mobile form? Yeah, well, typically, typically go, ahead. go ahead. No, um, so, you know, there is uh, policy around e-signatures, like more, more broad than just uh, in regards to logistics or, or tracking, right? So a lot of us now sign documents on, on DocuSign, uh, on EchoSign, and so on those platforms, there needs to be a receipt of who signed the document at what time uh, and on what device. And as long as those things are, are recorded, then that constitutes a, a, an e-signature. So there needs to be a history or an audit trail of who did it and at what time. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Um, and moving on, would it, it make if, sense? If I, could, if, if I could just address that one yeah. more bit. Um, I'm looking at the definition. This is the FMCSA's official definition. It's in 49 CFR 390.5 of electronic signature. It says that electronic signature means a method of signing an electronic communication that identifies and authenticates a particular person as the source of the electronic communication and indicates such person's approval of the information contained in the electronic communication in accordance with the government paperwork Elect elimination act, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So as, as Will said, it simply needs to identify the person and indicate approval. It doesn't necessarily have to be the, the person's name scribbled out. It, it, it can be checking a box as long as there's indication that that's what that check mark means. All right, got it. And next question, would it make sense to anchor BOL in similar documents on the blockchain? Are there legal hurdles to doing so? Yeah. Um, so. Uh, Blockchain's, uh, you know, a piece of technology that you know you can anchor electronic signatures to. Um, but I would say it's kind of flying. Well, it's kind of like flying a spaceship to uh, the grocery store. Um, of course, you can, uh, but not necessary. And uh, I would say there's probably the not the added benefit of of doing so. And I don't know any legal implications specific to blockchain that would prevent you or, or make it less uh, user friendly than any other platform. I think you have all the same issues that you have with any other type of, of transmittal. All right, great. And next question, is it okay for a driver to have an electronic trip sheet? Sorry, uh, is the, can you say that question again? Yeah, it says, is it okay for the driver to have an electronic trip sheet? Yeah, um, absolutely. And we've done, on, on the vector side, we've done that across, out of, God, I don't know how many companies, but, you know, a trip sheet for, for, for folks who don't know, you know, it, it records the activity of a driver throughout um, their trip. You know, what stops they make, how long they were at each stop, what did they unload? And it's usually used uh, to help with, um, payroll so you know drivers uh, get paid by mile get paid for the the kind of municipalities they drive into so all that factors into their pay and so mm -hmm. um you know historically that's been on a piece of paper and that piece of paper would either get faxed or or mailed into an office and so um what we can do is we digitize that so the driver's entering the information on their mobile device or it's actually integrated with their telematics so it's pulling the mileage data the time data off and then we're integrating to a company's payroll system to automate the the payment um so there's a lot of benefits to electronic trip sheets but that's not necessarily um a a, a shipping document that's passed between shipper and, and carrier that's more of an internal carriers process and we've been very effective not only digitizing that but a lot of the other manual processes uh, that carries out. Yeah, to amplify, there, there are no FMCSA requirements to have trip sheets. Um, it doesn't go from the, the shipper to the carrier or the carrier to the shipper. Um, and it's not the same as a driver's log or record of duty status, which records the driver's hours for purposes of the hours of service regulations. It's it's simply an activity log uh, that, that hooks into um, 
human resources and payroll. All right, great. And next question, the FMCSA is looking at collecting information and data around driver detention. Can the shipping documents be used to demonstrate evidence of detention? Rick, you mentioned that documents are evidence of delivery and acceptance. Uh, I, I don't think that I'm thinking of the uniform straight bill of relating right now. Uh, it's, there's really nowhere to indicate on there that a driver, for instance, um, got to a, a shipper site and was detained or got to a consignee site and was detained. I think uh, there might be other better ways to document um, the time that you arrived and the time that you were actually allowed access to either load or unload the freight um, through a, a uh, trip sheet or even your driver logs might be able to show evidence of that, but but probably not. Um, you know, I don't I don't think you can do it on the bill of lading without um, reworking it pretty significantly. Well, the add, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll add to that. And so, uh, Rick is correct in that it, it's not on the, the the I say native bill of lading, um, but with uh, e documents and eBOL. Um, the time when bill of ladings are issued uh, from the time when a driver initially uh, checked in at a guard shack, you know, those are two activity points that are now being logged on solutions like ours. And that delta um, can be calculated uh, to generate the detention time. So um, either, you know, manually you can annotate an eBOL or it can be derived from the activity that's generated uh, through the, through our solution or others. Great. Um, and next question, what are differences between household and general freight for requirements of physical and electronic BOL? Do you even need, uh, do you need even a digital copy for both? If you do not need even electronic, can EDI potentially solve this? Uh, for household goods carriers, there is actually uh, a requirement that a copy of the bill of lading accompany the shipment, which is different than the or the lack of requirement for a non-hazmat general freight shipment. Um, so for non-hazmat general freight, uh, you definitely could accomplish uh, the bill of lading using an e-document. Um, for household goods, I believe the requirement is for a paper document at this time. I'd have to, I'd be happy to, to verify that if you want to shoot me an email and, and uh, we can fix or address that offline. Great. And so and is it... Sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. It's okay. Go uh, ahead. Um, no, there was a, there's an EDI portion of that um, question as, as well. And, uh, you know, whether, uh, you know, it's an 856 or 204, like the EDI message can potentially uh, be used to generate the, the bill of lading, um, which then can be transmitted electronically. So uh, EDI can be uh, a tool to, to solve for electronic, electronic transmission of BOLs. Okay, great. Um, and I was just going to say, we do have um, contact details for those of you submitting questions. So we'd be happy to follow up with you after that, um, as Rick mentioned. Um, and next question, are you aware of any Canadian regulations around this or how this might be approached differently in Canada? It's uh, a good question. I had, I'm licensed to practice law in, in DC and in Kentucky. So um, I try to <laughs> I have a hard enough time keeping track of what's going on on this side of the border. Um, I suspect that it is, there are similar issues there, but I, I don't know of any specifics. Okay, great. And next question, are you aware of any multimodal initiatives in driving eBOL adoption? Uh, the only one specifically that I know of is several years ago, the International Vessel Operators uh, Association did file a petition with FIMSA over um, electronic uh, transmission of shipping papers 
for vessels and intermodally with rail and truck so that you could do an electronic uh, transmittal of shipping papers um, from the ocean carrier to the, the trucker or the rail uh, carrier and vice versa. Um, as far as I know, that's still pending at, at FEMSA, and I don't believe that it's even been published for, for public comment yet. Okay, great. And we'll take one more question here. Well, a couple more questions here. Uh, what are your perspectives about cross-technology vendor interoperability in exchanging digital trade documents between companies? How might this aid the digital silo issue we risk creating as we move from paper to machine-readable documents? Yeah, um, that's a that's a great question, and um, you know, I, I think again, it's 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 adhering to somewhat of a standard and helping um, you know other people in the community, other companies uh, develop the standard. Um, but from our perspective, you know, we have an open platform, meaning we have APIs and web services that people can call in to get their uh, documentation. And not only that, we've done a number of integrations where we push. So some companies don't have the resources to uh, integrate. And so what we do is we take on the heavy lifting and, and push that information to wherever uh, they, they need. Um, but we very much believe in an open world. And um, I think that will only help the uh, industry advance from an e-documents perspective. And, um, there's a lot of things further downstream you can do in terms of automation and elimination of manual data entry with regards to e-documents. So we're very much uh, believers in, in sharing and, and, and uh, breaking that digital silo. Mm -hmm. All right, great. And it looks like we'll get to one more here. We are looking at a program where the customer signs the screen and we push the signature where it needs to be on the bill of lading. Does that suffice? Is there an option to email documents? Yeah, it depends on the vendor. So I can only you know talk about it from our perspective at, at Vector. Um, so you know, in terms of electronic signature proof, you need to make sure that you can identify who the signer is, that there's you know clear intent to sign what was you know captured, right? Not some other random document, and that is is verifiable. So. You know, you can take down information about the driver login, the IP address, the device, all that information, the GPS timestamp as well, all the information, as long as it's there, um, that suffices for uh, that electronic signature. And to the second part of the question around email, yes, absolutely. Um, we can not only email, but FTP, send through API, um, the, the document. Yeah. The, the one definition that I have is in the hazardous materials regulations that defines EDI as simply computer to computer transmission according to a format agreed upon by the sender and receiver. So that would encompass uh, email easily. All right, perfect. Well, that is all that we have for today, everyone um, listening in. We received a ton of questions, and we will be happy to follow up with you uh, via email after the session for those that we were not able to get to. We appreciate you all for taking the time to listen in. Thank you to Vector for partnering with us on today's presentation. And of course, thank you to Will and Rick for sharing your insights with us today as well. We appreciate being here and hope you'll join us again for another webinar very soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you to Rick. Yep. Enjoyed it. Take care. Thanks.